Hello, church. Good to see you. You're looking good. <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, why don't we thank the worship team? They've done an awesome job. So good. And I'll just pray before we take our seats because we're standing on holy ground. Amen. And we honor the word of God. So, Father, we just uh, stand here right now, and God, we ask that you would help us to take in this word. God, uh, we pray you'd minister to us. God, your word gives us light. God, it shows the way. It gives us direction and wisdom. So, God, we just pray that we grab a hold of it, and God, that you'd lead us on the pathway to life in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Take your seats. If you're at home, lean in. Let's get ready for a great word. We're continuing our series called A Better Way. A Better Way. I've really enjoyed this series and it's been speaking into relationships in our, and our relational world. But more than that, what it actually is doing is it's talking about taking individual responsibility for the way that we treat others, for the way that we speak, the way that we act and the way that we respond to others in our life. And so that's a powerful thing because often we can just, you know, blame everybody else, but we need to learn to take responsibility and know that the the control is in our hands. Because this is the deal. There are two forces that are at work within our lives all the time. Galatians chapter 5 lays this out for it says we've got our sinful nature and we have the Holy Spirit. And the two are constantly at war. But in Galatians chapter 5, in verse 16, it says, so I say Let the Holy Spirit guide your lives because that is the better way. Jesus came and gave us a better way to live. And so I don't want to live a life just doing things the way they were or doing things because that's how I feel or whatever it is. I want to to engage in this better way. Brennan used an example earlier in the series about the apple core appeal, a slicer thing, a better way of producing an apple so that you can eat it. You know, there's so many things in our life and so many inventions that, I mean, a dishwasher, that's a better way, right? There are so many things that have been created and invented to give us a better way. But more than that, Jesus came. And so we are not under the old law, but we're under the new law, under under the grace covenant. And there is a better way. And we need to continue to learn what that way is and walk in that way. Because Galatians 5 talks about when we, when we live by our sinful nature, the kinds of things that are produced are uh, impurity and idolatry and hostility and jealousy and outbursts of anger and envy and drunkenness. And it talks about all these things that manifest in our sinful nature, but it talks about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That if we would submit our lives to God and allow the Holy Spirit to rise up within us, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and gentleness, and faithfulness, and self-control. A better way to live, and a better way to love. So we need to keep putting to death the sinful nature, and letting the Holy Spirit lead and guide us in His way of love. But this is what we need to understand, is that this is only possible when we are entirely reliant on the Holy Spirit. We actually can't live and produce this kind of love in our lives by our own strength and by our own means. You know, the Bible says that in in 1 John chapter 4 that God is love. God is love. So the only way that we can produce the kind of love that God produces or wants in us is by living in God. It says in verse 17, as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. God is love. We need to understand that because the rhetoric out there is that love is love. Love is what you feel. Love is what you make it. Love is what makes you feel good. Love is not a feeling. God is love. And he lays out and he gives us great direction in his word about how we can outwork his kind of love. And we've been unpacking the love passage. You kind of got to say it like that because it's the love passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's read, in, read at most weddings and it's this description of how we can love one another. That we fill the air with love. Sing it with me. Love is in the air, everywhere we look around. Oh, come on, very nice, guys. Very nice. What's love got to do, got to do, got to do? What's your favourite love song? What about, must have been love? 
but it's over now. <laughs> That's not a good one. Love's not over. Just began. Amen. We covered love is patient and love is kind. That was like eating dirt a little bit through that sermon. For me anyway, I was like, oh gosh, patient. Anyway, we got through it. So we're going to continue. 1 Corinthians 13, picking it up in verse 4, it says, Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It's a pretty powerful couple of verses right there. But what you can see in these verses is there's a progression of fear, anger, and resentment. Because envy, jealousy, boasting, being proud and rude, demanding our own way, being selfish, they are all driven by fear. They're responses that are driven by fear in our lives. Because when we're jealous of others, we're fearing that we may not get the blessing that they have. We may not be able to have what they have. When we're boasting, we're, we're fearing that maybe we won't be recognized or we won't be valued the way that we should be. When we're acting in pride or being rude and selfish, demanding our own way, it's literally FOMO. Fear of missing out. F-O-M-O. Fear of missing out. I mean, it's a modern term that we've got these days, but it's from the Bible. We literally have a fear of missing out, fear of, you know, being left behind. And so all those emotions are driven by fear. But the Bible tells, it that, tells us that there is no place for fear in love. There is no place for fear in love. It says it like this in verse 18, 1 John 4. It says, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Yeah. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. See, when we allow fear in our lives, when we don't deal with fear and we allow those manifestations of fear in our lives, that's taking up space where God's love is supposed to reside. Now, I don't know about you, but I want more of God's love and I don't want fear taking up space in my life, but I want God's love to fill me to overflowing. So what does fear need to do? Fear needs to go. We've got to deal with fear. We've got to starve fear. That's the first point. Because we are not driven by fear. Fear is the language of the enemy. Fear is the language of the devil. So he comes along and he dangles envy and selfishness and pride and boasting. He dangles all those things in front of us, trying to get us to be motivated by fear. But God wants us to be motivated by love by the Holy Spirit. I love it in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 in the Passion Translation. And it says, love refuses to be jealous. Love refuses. I'm not going to let fear rise up in my life. I refuse to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. See, when we understand the fullness of God's love, we know that God's Love and his blessing is not a dam that once it dries up, once it's all used up, then it's run out and that's it. We know that God's love is like a flowing river that never runs dry, that never runs out. And I love this concept. If we're seeing somebody else get blessed and we see that, and if we have an understanding of how God works and it's a flowing river, then I'm just a little bit downstream and that blessing is coming my way. Whatever it is that God has in store for me is coming my way. I don't, don't need to, to, to be jealous or envious about what anybody else has because even more than that, it's not just about that oh, it's going to come to me at some point. It's about that it's coming from my God. You know, that person got blessed by my God. My God did that for them. My God who created the heavens and the earth. My God who tells the stars where to place themselves in the sky. My God who tells the ocean, this is your boundary, don't go past it. My God who does incredible things, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. My God who is able to exceedingly, abundantly, more than I could ever ask or imagine, pour out blessing into my life that I could not contain. That is my God. So I cannot boast in my own achievements. There is no point me boasting in what I can do. I love Isaiah chapter 29 where, where he says, should, the, should what is formed say to who formed it? Oh, you don't. You didn't make me. I made myself. H hello, should the pot say to the potter? You made a mistake. This isn't right. 
My God, I love 1 Corinthians at the end of chapter 1. It says, if you're going to blow a trumpet, blow a trumpet for God. If you're going to boast in anything, don't boast in yourself. Boast in God because He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one, the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the one who is able to do miracles after miracle. He leads us into paths of righteousness. So let's boast in our God because really... Jealousy, envy, boasting in ourselves and pride and selfishness, that's really a poor way of living. God has given us a better way. He says, step into this better way. Drive out fear with love. You know, we think hatred is the opposite of love, but actually fear is the opposite of love. And often what we're trying to do when it comes to love and we're trying to earn God's love and we're striving for God's love and all we need to do is remind ourselves that we are swimming in a pool, in an ocean of love. We don't need to strive for just a drop or for half a cup of water from God. He says, I I put you in the ocean. You're swimming in an ocean of love. Let's just remind ourselves of God's goodness and his grace in our lives. Amen? Amen? As we keep going in that verse, love does not demand its own way. It says this, love... Is not irritable. (laughs) Does anyone else find that a bit funny? It's a bit amusing. Love is not irritable. If you've been married for any length of time, you know that love is kind of irritable. (laughs) But it says love is not irritable. And I look at that statement and I think, that's bold. That's a big statement. Love is not irritable? Wow. That's That's a new way of thinking and living. But this is, it's not saying, or sorry, other versions in other, yeah, it says not easily angered. It's not easily irritated. It's not easily angered. So what it's not saying is that we're never allowed to be angry, that anger is sin and anger is wrong and being irritated is wrong. It's not saying that. We see examples of scripture or in scripture of righteous anger. And we we could in fact say that anger is a, a healthy and a normal response to situations of injustice. It's healthy and it's normal in that scenario. But what this is talking about in this passage is talking about a pattern of anger. It's talking about a spirit of anger. And that is unhealthy. And the Bible does talk about how we need to nip that in the bud straight away because that begins to grow. And undealt with fears, pride, envy, jealousy, selfishness, manifests ugly. (laughs) That stuff manifests ugly. It takes hold of our thoughts and our feelings and we begin to see a spirit of anger manifest in our lives. So when we're talking about this concept of irritability, being irritable, it's somebody who's consistently on edge. They have uncontrolled emotions. They fly off the handle. I think the message version even says that in the passage, flies off the handle easily. It's talking about unreasonable responses. That the response doesn't match the actual problem. I think about my toddler when I think about unreasonable responses or unreasonable emotions. <laughs> like when I make toast in the morning for my toddler. And yesterday she had triangles. I cut it up into triangles and she wanted triangles and she ate the triangles. But today I cut up triangles and I've got it all wrong. And she cannot eat the toast because the toast is in the shape of a square, not a triangle or whatever it is. Today today she wants squares, not triangles. And so there's this unreasonable meltdown. There's this unreasonable manifestation of emotion and feeling and throwing yourself on the floor because my toast wasn't cut the right way. See, unreasonable. Just got to think of a toddler. I'm like, all right. Don't worry about the toast. And she's like, she saw her brother have a banana. Banana. All right, you know what? I'm choosing my battles. You can have a banana. So I grab the banana and I begin to open it for her. Another big meltdown. There's all this crying going on. I'm like, what have I done wrong? I was not supposed to open the banana. She wanted to open the banana. How she wants to open it. I'm not supposed to open the banana. That's it. Put that banana aside. Get another banana here. Have your banana. She walks away. Five seconds later, comes back. Open. (laughs) 
And they say parenting is great. Parenting is fun. Yeah, let's all just go and have kids. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's awesome, all right? Uh, anyway, unreasonable. So irritability is talking about where there's a mismatch of what the actual problem is, what actually happened to what was said, and the response is enormous in comparison. That's, that's, when, you, that's when you would consider something to be highly irritable. I think about it in terms of a physical injury. When I did a little bit of work as a physio, one of the things you want to unpack and explore when somebody comes in with pain or discomfort or whatever is you want to understand how irritable is this? How much is it affecting your life? Because one of the first questions you'll ask is what actually sets it off? What is, what is it that causes the pain? Is it, is it after an entire day's labour in a position where your shoulder is, in, you know, is compromised? If it's after an entire day, well, you know what, it's kind of reasonable. But if you've just moved your arm to here and all of a sudden your shoulder's gone from a 3 out of, a pain, three out of 10 pain to 8 out of 10 pain, then that's unreasonable. That's what you would consider highly irritable. You also want to know, well, how long does it then take to settle down? Do you then have to soak it and bath it for an hour and take any, any inflammatories for it to settle down or does it just go away within five minutes? You want to unpack some of this stuff because it's giving you indications, giving you information about how, what is actually going on and how serious it is. And the thing is, either two or things have occurred. It's either a serious pathology that needs to be dealt with straight away. But most of the time, sadly, it's a small problem or a mild pathology that has not been managed, not been dealt with over a long period of time and all of a sudden something is beginning to manifest and there are secondary complications and there are muscles that are doing things that they're not supposed to do, they're taking over and then the nervous system is getting involved and all sorts of things have happened from a very small problem that has been allowed to get out of control. So this is a, this is a thing, if we notice ourselves getting irritable, then we need to get onto it straight away. We've got to deal with the root. That's the second thing. First thing, starve your fears. Fear's got to go. There's no place for fear in love. The second thing is deal with the root. Yeah. Hebrews 12 talks about a bitter root that grows up and it, and it causes trouble and it defiles many. And that's what happens when we don't deal with the things in our life. We begin to, it begins to overflow into our relationships and the people around us. Anger is the root of bitterness. And if we let it grow begins to take over our heart, begins to take over our spirit and what begins to spit out is angst and spite and disrespect and disregard for others and a, a pattern of hatred. We see a very good example of this in scripture with David's brother Eliab in 1 Samuel 17 and, and David's been sent by his father to the battle lines to bring his brother, to bring his brothers some food, some lunch, some cheese and bread and whatever else. So he's been sent by his father. He arrives at the battle lines. He doesn't know what's been going on, but when he arrives, Goliath comes out and gives his great big speech and says, who dare come and fight me? And, you know, goes on and on. And, and David's like, whoa, what have I walked into? What's going on? And so he begins to ask questions to the people around him. He says, what's going on here? Now, David's brother, who's not far away, overhears David asking questions. And all of a sudden, something begins to rise up in his life. I'll read it to you in, in verse 28. It says, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? Now, remember, David's father sent him there. And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? And then he begins to say, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. And you came down only to watch the battle. And verse 29, David says, now what have I done? Said David. Can I, can I even speak? And he then turned away to somebody else and brought up the matter and the men answered him as before. So you can see David's asking this harmless question and his brother has heard, overheard this and all of a sudden something has just risen up on the inside of him and anger and bitterness spits out of his mouth. I know how wicked you are. Now, they're brothers, right? So clearly that's not just like just something that's just happened in the moment. There's, there's history, right? Clearly, David's older brother has perhaps been watching him his whole life, seeing him get blessed, seeing him anointed, seeing things turn out really well for David. And, and there's been a growing root of bitterness on the inside of him that's never been dealt with. And what's manifested 
is hatred and anger and resentment. So you can see a major overreaction to a harmless question. I don't know if you've ever been witness to something like that in your own world. If you've seen somebody just, the, it's like the lid just came off. I can guarantee it wasn't that moment that caused it. It was over a long period of undealt with fear, bitterness, jealousy, pride that just has that's been swept under the carpet and hasn't been dealt with and all of a sudden it's bubbled over. So if you notice yourself becoming irritable, ask yourself why. Ask yourself why. If, if you notice that your responses and your emotions are, are, are far too large for what is actually going on, then you've got to say, hey, there's something going on. And this is the first step to getting freedom is this, is actually admitting that there is a problem. Watch the fruit of your life. And if it's not right, if it's not lining up with the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, what should be coming out, then ask yourself why and what is it that I need to deal with? Because that is the first step, admitting that there is a problem in the first place. And then you can ask for forgiveness. Say, God, forgive me for holding on to this. Whatever it is that I'm holding on to, forgive me. I'm not supposed to hold on to that stuff. I'm supposed to give it to you. I want to walk in freedom. I want to walk in love. I want to walk in the better way that you've given me. And then ask for help in forgiving others. Because sometimes there have been things going on and maybe people have wronged you. But if you're holding on to that, you need to ask God to help you forgive those people in your world. Because the enemy wants to hold you down with chains of unforgiveness. But God wants to set you free. He wants to give you a better way. And then ask God to fill you with joy. Because you can't be angry and joyful at the same time. You just can't. Ask God to fill you with his overwhelming joy. And if you, haven't, if you think you've got nothing to be joyful about, then maybe just consider, are you not saved? Have your sins not been forgiven? Have you not been redeemed? Have you not been set free? Do you not serve an incredible God? You've got breath in your lungs and you've got a life to live. You've got something to rejoice in. For this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. You know, it's a spiritual battle that requires a spiritual response. We've got to get our praise on. We've got to lift our voice, lift our, our eyes to the heavens and recognize that we're not called to live in chains bound by unforgiveness and anger and bitterness. But we're called to be set free. The third thing is this, is we need to throw out the scorecard. We've got to starve our fears. Fear has no place. We've got to dig out the root, get to the root of the problem. And the third thing is we've got to throw out the scorecard. It says, love keeps no record of wrong. And all the spouses nudge there. Keeps no record of wrong. You know, record keeping is a spirit of resentment. If we refuse to let go, we're cultivating a spirit of resentment in us. The New King James Version says, love thinks no evil. Love thinks no, no evil. Love doesn't even think evil. It won't even contemplate. It won't even give it life. Love thinks no evil. So what that's saying is that love doesn't jump to conclusions about others. Love is not quickly convinced of the wrong of others. Love gives the benefit of the doubt. Love chooses to believe the best in others, not focus on the wrongs. Love refuses to let the devil get a foothold. Love refuses to allow a root of bitterness to grow up in our lives. Now, let's be clear. This is not saying that we can let people wrong us. It's not what this is saying at all. It's not about letting people wrong you because that's not love either. The next verse, it talks about love rejoices in the truth. And when there's evil going on, then it needs to be dealt with and it needs to be brought to the right place, to the right people, and it needs to be dealt with appropriately. It's not saying you can just walk around and let people walk all over you. That's not what it's saying at all. But what this is talking about is you taking responsibility for the way that you think and feel because that's what you're in control of. That's what you have the power to do. And it's talking about guarding your heart and your mind against resentment and unforgiveness. Because too often what we don't even realise is that when we insert wrong, wrong, we wrongly assume or wrongly presume somebody else's intentions or thoughts or feelings about something, we're inserting our own thoughts in there. So what we're doing is we're, we're shutting them out, we're building a prison, we think we're building a prison around them, but we've actually built a prison around ourselves. We've actually imprisoned ourselves to our own thoughts and our feelings about that person. That person can walk away free at any time. 
but we've got to learn to throw out the scorecard. Let's not keep ourselves in a prison of our thoughts and feelings because often we can hold up the record of wrong. So people in our lives that have hurt us or things have gone on and we hold up the record and we say, this is, this is your record of wrong. You've hurt me. It's got things on there like liar, cheating, stealing, unloving, nasty, been unhelpful, been a troublemaker, been defiant. And we can hold up that record of wrong and say, this is, this is you, this is, why I, this is why I am the way that I am. But we've got to realise there's somebody else that's called the accuser. And that's the devil. So I don't want to be an accuser. That's not the kind of life I want to live. Jesus came to set me free. It's time to throw away the scorecard. Throw it away. Because you know what? Keeping mental scorecards is exhausting. It's exhausting and it makes us miserable. But Jesus said, a new command I give you. Love others as I have loved you. It says, we love because he first loved us. It says, forgive one another just as God in Christ forgave you. You know, if we, if we refuse to forgive others, it shows that we have truly failed to realize and grasp our great need for forgiveness. See, Jesus kept no record of wrong. Jesus kept no record of wrong. When he went to the cross, he hung on that cross and he said, Father, forgive them. For they don't even know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. When Jesus died on that cross, our record of wrong was completely obliterated. Was completely destroyed. Our record of wrong, when Jesus went to the cross, he destroyed it and he obliterated it so that we couldn't be held, held against that. And when he stands before the Father and God says, what about this person? And Jesus holds up our record. And he says, this is the only thing you can charge this person with. <laughs> forgiven. I've been forgiven, been set free. This is Jesus. This is him holding our record. He took our sin, our shame, our guilt, our pride, our envy. He took our selfishness. He took, our, he took everything, all our sin, and he nailed it to the cross and printed Forgiven on our record. So love keeps no record of wrong. There's a better way. You know, you can be free from fear and you can be free from anger and you can be free from resentment by walking by the Holy Spirit, walking with the Holy Spirit, allowing God to fill and overflow your life. We're going to continually do this though. It's a daily thing. I've got to do it every day. God, renew my mind. God, check my heart. God, guide my steps. Help me. Let's starve our fear, get to the root, dig out the roots and throw out the scorecard because God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of anger. God hasn't given us a spirit of resentment. God's given us a spirit of power, of love and of sound mind. So let's walk in that better way, church. It's a process. It's a journey. We've got to walk it out step by step, but we don't need to do it alone. God gives us his spirit so that we can do this journey. I just want to pray for people today who maybe you haven't experienced the forgiveness of God in your life and you're still carrying sin and you're carrying shame and you're carrying hurts. And can I tell you something? God hasn't called you to live this way. He has a better way. There is a better way to live life then laden and, and heavy burdened by the sin and the wrongs and all the things that have happened to us. And I want to encourage Christians praying as I give out this invitation. I want to invite people into a relationship with God. Maybe you don't know God. Maybe you've never experienced the love of God. I want to invite you into a relationship where you can ex experience the love of God overflowing measure that love that expels all fear, that love that casts out the wrong um, attitudes and the wrong mindsets within us and helps us to walk a life following Him. If that's you, I want, you, I want to invite you into a relationship with God and I'll give you the words to say, 
It's a prayer that if you mean it from your heart, I believe as you invite Jesus in, you receive the forgiveness of God into your life and he sets you free. I don't want to encourage you to say this prayer with me, church. Every, every person will bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's say this together. If you're online, let's say this together. It goes, dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. Thank you for forgiving my sin, for setting me free, for giving me a future and a hope. I choose to walk with you. In your name I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, if you made that decision, that's the best decision you can ever make in your life. Maybe you made it for the first time or maybe you've, you've, you know that you once were walking with God but you walked away and this is you coming back. Then I want to congratulate you. It's an awesome decision, but we want to help you in that journey. We'd love to help you pray with you, give you a Bible or just help you in that next step. So if that's you, if you're online, Click the raise hand button, then click request prayer. There's a team of people that would love to pray with you and help you on that journey. If you're here in the building and you said that prayer and you want to talk to somebody or pray with someone about it, head out to the Welcome Hub after the service and we'd love to meet you there and help you on that journey. Sounds good? Praise God. Let's give God a shout of praise.